Ladies and gents, welcome to the reaction. This is the 1918 flu pandemic, the forgotten plague, Exo Street Part Six by the channel Extra Credits. Why did everyone forget about the flu pandemic so fast? Partly because its effects were intermingled with the death and depression of World War One, and partly because we chose to forget. I don't know about the last time we chose to forget some, uh, you know, devastating historical events like that. You can't just choose to forget, right? I mean, with the, you know, everybody just chose to forget. That doesn't, that doesn't feel right. I don't think that happened. World War One probably. That's what you know, basically pushed it down, right? The Great War because it happened literally, you know, alongside the World War. So I guess that was the reason. I totally forgot there is a sixth part. I thought that it was a five-part series, and I even thought like, wait a minute, there was no end conclusion. That was a bit weird. I even thought that. But I'm like, all right, fine, and I just moved on. But then somebody commented, you haven't re reacted to full series. There's still sixth part. And I'm like, what the hell? Look at that. So yeah, let's watch it. Rio de Janeiro, 1919. This year, Carnival is different. The flu that had killed 15,000 in Rio is gone, but its spirit lingers. Float crews adopt macabre themes taken from the height of the outbreak. There's the block of the holy house, playing off a popular euphemism for the hospital. Behind them parades the block of the midnight tea, named after a rumor that doctors killed terminal flu patients with opium overdoses. Streetcars pass, decorated with teapots and cemetery gates. A few months before, the same streetcars had collected the city's dead. All right, what's with the teapot though? Huh, that's... I understand that, you know, uh, the... the, the the carriage basically, but teapot, I didn't get that reference. What was that about mid, whatever it was, I don't know the, yeah, you know, I can't pronounce the mid 90 or whatever that was. So the point is they were celebrating uh, something that's a rumor, but it's unethical, I guess, that they killed terminal patients with uh, opium overdose. They were celebrating that. Why was that part of the parade? I don't, okay. The third wave of the pandemic kept killing until 1920, but it was clear that the worst was over. Humans had done little to stop the virus. Instead, it simply ran out of fuel. Those who caught it became immune, and it spread across the globe so fast, infecting so many people, that herd immunity began to protect those who escaped previous waves. But there were still flare-ups. On November 11, 1918, the news broke. An armistice. The Great War was over. People flooded the streets, ignoring bans on public gatherings. And in each city, a new wave of infections followed the impromptu celebrations. The same would happen again and again on a smaller scale, as loved ones gathered to welcome returning soldiers home. There were still outbreaks, still deaths. But everyone could see it was trailing off. The horror was past. All that remained was to count the cost, a project that continues to this day. In the years after the pandemic, researchers initially estimated the disease had killed 20 million people. Okay, how does that project even run today, after 100 years? How are they supposed to track now? Modern estimates have increased that number to 50 million. Though because statistics aren't available in the worst hit regions, like India and Russia, the final number may be twice as many. Damn. According to modern million. estimates, it killed 17 to 20 million in India, perhaps 4 million in Indonesia, possibly a million in Russia, 400,000 in France, and 390,000 in Japan. In the United Kingdom, it sickened a quarter of the population and killed up to 220,000. In the U.S., it took around 675,000, more than the Civil War, and killed 16,000 in Philadelphia. More than the Civil War? Damn, and there is no reenactment for uh, Spanish flu there. But damn, seriously, people don't even think about Spanish flu and it killed more than the civil war in the US alone. That is just after. Look at the numbers, man. Holy shit. And this this happened alongside World War I, which also had, you know, massive death toll. So that particular period of time, right, World War I time, that was just horrible all around, right, from all sides, whether it's disease or just people killing each other. Too many deaths. Fear alone. But for a disease that killed so many, it's hard to point out direct consequences. In fact, the flu seems to have worked in tandem with the war, each magnifying the effects of the other. 
In the 1920s, a wave of political unrest swept countries around the globe. This was because of the war, but also because the flu had revealed deep inequalities, especially in colonial rule. Post-viral fatigue from flu infections probably contributed to the depression and listlessness that took hold after the war. Yet, despite the heavy toll the flu took, and the- Yeah, so events like flu, you know, famine, things like that, basically shows the uh, real side of society's, you know, uh, issues, basically. It all works fine until it works fine, but something like the flu comes, uh, you know, famine comes, then you realize that what is the major flaw of this society. The heroism of medical workers that died fighting it. There's still no monument commemorating the event, other than plaques marking Seriously. mass graves. Text Holy shit, that's true, isn't it? Every, you know, uh, great uh, doctor, scientist who basically did, uh, you know, great work around this time, fought left and right, day and night without even sleeping, without caring about their own health. There is a statue of them, and yet there are statues of generals who fought in wars like World War I. Folks mention it, but usually just in passing. We chose not to remember, which is why some have christened it the Forgotten Plague. There are theories why... Look, it's global. It was a global flu with, uh, you know, 50 million, even 100 million deaths. We can't choose to forget it. I don't think that can happen at that scale, right? Uh, a group can choose, for, choose to forget cer certain things. Entire world at that number, we can't just choose to forget it. I think World War I and, uh, you know, all the articles that were you know written because of World War One, all the news and things basically you know overshadowed the flu at the time I think that's what happened society chose to forget the flu perhaps it came and went so fast that people simply remembered it as part of the war or it's possible that focus on the war and inability to see the big picture yeah. meant that society never really absorbed what happened that's but the thing keep in mind it also hit a generation that was just more used to epidemics in a time where mass death may have been less shocking. Conversely, some have argued that the- Wait a minute, what epidemic at this scale was around this time or anybody's lifetime? Like, uh, 19, I guess, you know, 1870, 1880, were there any kind of uh, outbreak at this scale? Because I don't, I don't remember it. I don't know it, so I guess, so there could be. So what, around that time, the, that generation of people, there were outbreaks like left and right, is that it? Holy shit, I can't even imagine that because what ha happened last year and still going on today basically. You know, we just like, when is this going to finish? And oh my god, we are done with it after that. But imagine if something like that came every few years or decades, right? Which actually, you know, scientists are kind of predicting now, so I don't know. But imagine if that happened, how effed up that would be and what toll it would take on our psychology. So that's how the people were living at the time. Is that what he's saying? The flu was so traumatic. Families formed unspoken agreements never to discuss it. The memories that did endure were intensely personal. Lost parents, lost siblings, friends gone too soon. Families impoverished when their breadwinners died. In some cases, soldiers came back from the trenches to find their entire family wiped Whoa. out. Whoa. Ask your family, and you might find a story of your own. Whoa, imagine that, right? Holy shit. The horrible trench warfare. After all that gruesome war and you're like, oh, finally the war is over. I can go back home and live my life with my family. I can't wait to see my family. He goes back there and he realized that all of them died because of flu. Holy shit, that is just terrifying. Generations later, the trauma still lingers. Yet apart from Catherine Ann Porter's Pale Horse, Pale Rider, there was no explosion of novels about flu as there were about the war. It was a more difficult subject, its faceless enemy more challenging to portray than the man-made terror of the trenches. But Porter wasn't the only notable person to suffer from the flu. In fact, it infected so many famous people that it raised- Yeah, but I don't get it. This was World War I, not World War II. World War I happened because of certain events that happened. There is no one key person that you can blame on like you can do it in World War II, right? So, you know, if something like, you know, like World War II, if this happened in World War II, understand that like Hitler is the evil guy. It's like your, you know, your basic, you know, storytelling type of thing. He's the, you know, antagonist. He's the evil guy. 
who's basically going to kill the whole world unless we stop it. It's a story that gets, you know, get more publicity. I understand that. But World War One didn't have one singular enemy, right? It's the event that basically made all the countries band together and fight each other. So, you know, talking about that, that overshadowing somewhat, I understand that. But completely overshadowing the flu, I don't understand that. This is a chilling question. How different would our world be if even one of them had died? Among the ill were President Wilson, British Prime Minister David Lloyd George, Gandhi, Kaiser Wilhelm, and General Pershing. A generation of notable artists caught it as well, including T.S. Eliot and a young ambulance driver named Walt Disney. Damn. Franklin Roosevelt contracted it while sailing on USS Leviathan. Then there are the people we did lose. The president-elect of Brazil and Austrian painters Egon Schiele and Gustav Klimt. Lenin's right-hand man succumbed, clearing the way for his replacement, oh, Joseph Stalin. And in New York, the flu killed an obscure... Look, I, I, <clears throat> look Lenin's right-hand man would not be any better, right? Pretty sure. But maybe he might not have been as worse as Stalin was. I don't know. Imagine if he didn't die and Stalin never... Okay, first of all, Stalin was ambitious. I'm pretty sure he would have removed the obstacle. And I think Stalin would have come to power anyway. But imagine if he never came to power. What would that what would that change? I guess I would watch that alternate history hub channel, right? Because they frequently, you know, imagine scenarios like this and create videos. So yeah. German immigrant, allowing his son to cash in his life insurance and expand the family's real estate business. His name was Frederick Trump. You might be familiar with his grandson. But the flu Mr. also Trump. drove scientific discovery. Doctors developed new surgical techniques and procedures for disease containment. It likely sped up the civilian world's adoption of ambulances. The desperate vaccines produced during the pandemic, cocktails of antibodies from every bacteria doctors suspected, were the predecessor of today's combination vaccines, like diphtheria tetanus pertussis. Nurses, who bore so much of the burden, won new confidence and respect for their profession. Increasingly, their discipline became more than serving as doctor's assistants, and the flu helped them be seen as professionals in their own right. Many cities and nations, caught off guard by the crisis, established new health departments and organizations to monitor disease. It helped push the idea of national health insurance and government-provided medicine. And See, major events like the flu basically sheds the light on uh, real issues that we are not taking seriously. Like here, CDC came, insurance came, because we realized... We understand all the wars that we've been fighting for years, but we really forgot one issue. Like there is a there's a biological war happening in our body around us. You know, microorganism basically trying to attack us. So that is something we really need to focus because that th those things kill more of us than any war does, right? Because if these uh, stats are true, hundred million dead. That's more than World War One. That's more than World War Two deaths, right? So people just realize, okay, we need to do something. So CDC, and so same thing happened during the Apollo program, right? In the, during the Apollo program, uh, the famous photo of Earth, the first ever photo of Earth, right? Earth rise. During that, you know, people just saw that photo and hit them very differently, right? People before that drew the, fo you know, uh, this, uh, drew the art of the how a planet should look accurately enough, but without clouds, because I don't know, they just thought there would be no clouds. Obviously, they were wrong. So the original photo had clouds and everything just looked, uh, you know, Earth looked just awesome. But that also gave rise to all the, you know, environmental agencies, right? Lots of things were found at that time, right? That basically preserves our environment as a whole. That is pretty, you know, pretty important organization that even goes on today. Those were all founded after that photo, Earthrise photo. So certain event basically sparks something in humanity. This we like, okay, we have to do something about it. We were ignoring this. We have to do something about this now drove research. By the 1930s, researchers were crafting effective flu vaccines, and many who battled flu would go on to do great things. Anna Williams nurtured an entire generation of female researchers. FDR eulogized Welch via radio. And remember Oswald Avery, the guy Welch tasked with finding Pfeiffer's bacillus and who helped develop the pneumonia serum? Yeah. After the war, he returned to researching bacteria, trying to discern how a bacteria without a hard coating transformed into a bacteria with one. After laboring for 20 years, he finally found the substance that caused the change. Whoa. DNA. That's right. Avery discovered that the purpose of DNA is to carry genetic instructions. 
Today, he's considered a pioneer of modern genetics. The flu also drove um, DNA is pretty instrumental. Discovering of that is obviously big. And of course, the guy who found it basically uh, didn't have much of social life or if any, and just uh, just did his work. Newton was the similar. So I guess, you know, uh, people who did monumental things, not all of them, but, you know, often have no social life, have no interest in anything like that, but just interest in their work. Search into Pfeiffer's bacillus, which many still believed caused flu. After working in a military hospital during the war, one Scottish doctor devoted his life to studying microbes. One day, he accidentally left a culture of it out for the night. When he returned the next morning, he found a strange mold growing on it that killed any bacteria it touched. That man was Alexander Fleming. And the mysterious mold? It was penicillin. Whoa. The first wonder drug and probably the most consequential discovery of the 20th century. Even today, the 1918 flu remains a... He accidentally discovered penicillin, one of the most important things, antibiotics. Oh, that's just something. ...subject of study for researchers. In fact, over the last several decades, researchers and epidemiologists have started to make breakthroughs on the 1918 flu, helping us better understand what happened so we can combat the next great pandemic. Researchers still don't know where the flu emerged. There are way more theories than we portrayed. But we can now name the culprit. In 1998, researchers obtained a lung sample from a frozen grave in Alaska and confirmed what many suspected. The 1918 flu was H1N1, an avian strain, new then, but is less dangerous now that our immune systems have had a century of exposure. They've also begun to unravel the pandemic's mysteries. For instance, we now suspect that it killed young, healthy people precisely because they were young and healthy. Damn. Those patients that turned blue, they probably weren't killed by the flu at all, but by their own immune systems. Once infected, victims' immune systems triggered a massive inflammatory response known as a cytokine storm. But instead of neutralizing the flu, this enormous release of disease-killing cytokines filled the lung sacs with fluid. And yeah, I th you know, I reacted quite a few because there's a video on this immune, you know, immune system that obviously that happens, right? That's the thing about our immune system. Our, our immune system is just great, but sometimes, you know, uh, certain viruses can overwhelm it at the point that it, it, it basically harms us, right, in the process. It's like they're walking around with grenades and, you know, if the enemy force is overwhelming, lots of friendly fire happens. But yeah, that's why, you know, vaccines are really important. So if you introduce vaccine pretty early on, your you know, immune system suddenly, you know, gets used to the virus, right? And it doesn't go through the process of, you know, identifying and understanding of weeks of, you know, week or two's process. And then by then the virus is multiplied so much that it tries to attack it, but, you know, it ends up killing us by doing something like this. Inflamed them so much, they couldn't absorb oxygen. But the greatest lesson of the flu pandemic is that flu can't be ignored. We don't shrug off new flu strains anymore. In fact, many health organizations monitor both human and animal strains, yeah. predicting the dominant variety each season and creating vaccine ahead of time. If a new strain does arrive, we'll be much more prepared than doctors were in 1918. We have... Yeah... I don't know how much prepared we were, but yeah, prob definitely more prepared than 1918. We were definitely more prepared than that. But, uh, you know, I saw the documentary, I don't remember what, in 2014, there were certain scientists, basically, who were just studying something. There was a video that some scientist is on the boat or something predicting that some big virus probably will come pretty soon if we don't do something. I don't remember exact detail about that, but let's just say he kind of predicted that this, what happened last year, was coming. And it might be inevitable if we don't, you know, do something about that, you know, how people were basically, I don't know what the detail was that maybe people are just, you know, wet markets uh, was the point of the video. Or maybe people are not distancing themselves from the bats or just abusing bats habitat or whatever. And that could cause what happened, right? It's a, you know, taking time bomb that could go off anytime. There are, there is a... Uh, certain, uh, I don't know, sightseeing type of thing, zoo type of thing where people in China or somewhere where people go to the caves and look at the bats or something and scientists standing there was just explaining like how, you know, the... 
I don't know, crap from bats. Basically, somebody touches it can cause some kind of a virus outbreak. So it's a taking time or whatever. That video was from, I guess, 2014 or something. So that was really, you know, hindsight type of thing. Now watching that video just feels like, holy shit, this guy predicted it. We have electron microscopes, antivirals, vaccine labs, and tested containment plans. But a vaccine would still take months to produce meaning we'd start by using the same measures they did a century ago. Voluntary quarantine, banning public gatherings, staggering work hours. In fact, as Rob researched these episodes, the city where he lives, Hong Kong, closed schools to prevent a seasonal flu outbreak and killed birds that tested positive for avian influenza. A century later, the battle against the 1918 flu and its offspring continues. So seriously, Get your flu shot from an actual medical professional and not a uh, animated cat. Yeah, little did you know that in a year, year and a half, another thing is coming. But yeah, damn, 1918 flu pandemic, 100 million deaths. If that's real, then that's just fucking terrifying. It can't even compare to what we had. But then again, we were more prepared, like he said. Right, we like he said in the end, we suddenly did the lockdowns and closed everything down. So you know maybe that played a part. Uh, you know maybe uh, Spanish flu. I think you know I don't remember so what video it was, but somebody was saying that Spanish flu. Uh, you know Spanish flu itself was a bit more stronger, right, than uh, what we had last year. Obviously, it killed people in 12 hours. How you know the, this? Uh, he said that in one of the episode of this, but. Yeah, it was Spanish flu was definitely more stronger, but I don't know. Maybe because of our lockdowns, right? Because of our you know modern knowledge of this thing, maybe you know the death toll was not even close to what Spanish flu was. But I'm pretty sure Spanish flu was a bit stronger than what we had. So yeah, all right, people. There was the 1918 flu pandemic, the forgotten plague. It is a forgotten plague if that's the number. Right? Because nobody talks about it. I just found uh, you know the, the Spanish flu existed. You know, while reacting to one of these videos this past year, basically. Before that, I had no idea if uh, death toll was that high in India. In, in here, nobody knows about it. Nobody even talks about it. So, this is a forgotten plague. Right, people, if you like my reaction, don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out the reaction. There's a link in the description. Check out the cards, all the links, and I'll see you next time.